Good afternoon, fancy meat computers, coming to you live from Wide Land. Let's see here. Uh, I think I had it at seventy and seventy. That's a little bit thin still. 80 and 80. I wish I had like a square to hold up, you know? Yeah, I think that's, that'll do anyway. <sighs> How is everybody? Did everybody enjoy the snow day two days ago? Text on the box looks about right. Yeah. Good. I got COVID. Uh-oh. Winston got COVID. The snow is almost gone, and I am sad. That'll depend on where you're living for sure. Still had work to do on that snow day. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the thing about being an adult, eh? Uh, even even if the kids get a snow day, you don't necessarily. <laughs> yeah. It was amazing, aside from all the shoveling. I know, I was out there for like four hours. Uh, and uh, the neighbor was very kind and uh, brought us uh, brought his, his snowblower along. Which was very, very kind of him. Um... We live on a corner lot, you see. And, uh, you know, with a triple wide driveway. And our next door neighbor is like a 95 year old woman who, uh, you know, obviously, you know, when you have a, when you have a, uh, a neighbor who's like 95 years old, you do their shoveling for them. Like, obviously, you know. <coughs> oh, you like this? Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, I like it. I suppose the uh, the bow tie is primarily obscured by the camera, but it's like it's I've got my uh, periodic table bow tie on. Yeah. Well, yeah, especially when those neighbors show up, like you know, two and a half hours into it, and it takes them and you another hour and a half to clear it. You know. Hurry, guys! Laugh at the guy with COVID. Yeah, come on. <laughs> uh, thank you so yeah um, I don't think there's anything particularly to note uh, announcements wise um, for this class aside from the fact the snow we, the, the, uh, the snow day happened let's see um, yeah so, uh, the 95-year-old neighbor was not the one with the snowblower. No, she's, uh, I don't know. Like, it's it's kind of amazing, right? Because, like, she lived through the Depression, you know? But, uh, anyway. Our tutorial's recorded. Yes, I, uh, Mark made an announcement of that uh, about that recently on, uh, on Teams, if you took a look. He's keeping them in a folder on there, so there you go. Um, so that, also, office hours after class today, if anybody wants to come, it'll be on Teams. Um, so, those of you who, like, a, 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 a small number of you, um, actually came to lecture on Monday, um, although lectures were canceled, I was, like, shoveling all day, and I didn't actually realize that, uh, McMaster had gone to the extraordinary length 
of canceling both in-person and online classes, um, which, you know, I can't figure out for the life of me why it should be necessary to stop online classes while there's a snow day. It doesn't make any gosh darn sense. Um, because you don't have to get anywhere to do that. But, um, but yeah, um, my god. We had one anyway, basically. Um, so, there might be some useful nuggets for you. If you're having a little trouble with the, uh, if you, if you, if you're having a little trouble with the, uh, course materials so far. I basically used that lecture to solve some problems for you guys, and uh, you may find that useful and interesting, so I would recommend checking it out. But yeah. Um, oh, possible power outages. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know, but like, you know. You know. But yeah. <clears throat> Uh, lol, why are we doing coding bat without knowing how to code for people who have never coded before? Because I don't know what I'm doing. Well, the, um, the only way to get to the point where you do know where you're doing is to try it. And, um, the, uh, tried and true method of, um, learning how to code is actually code along with prof. So anytime you see me typing out programming code, it's extremely useful and valuable for you, the student, to type out what I'm typing out, sort of as I'm typing it out, or if you want to, like, come back to the video later and, um, like, type out all of the examples that I do, but, like, it's very important that my code passes through your fingertips. Um, that would be one way, but, um, but yeah, it also demonstrates the process. Like, I don't know how you would, like, presumably you want to learn how to code problems to be able to pass the assignments and stuff. So, um, you know, seeing how that's done, you know, that's, that's how it's done here. So, um, do we follow along on an IDE? Uh, for those of you who don't know what that means, that's an integrated development environment. I would say, um... Take a look at the pi take a look at the Anaconda package. Um, there should be some good IDEs that you can use in there. Yeah, and uh, you can use an IDE. I personally don't. I just use a I just use a um, a text editor and terminal because I'm a Linux guy, and uh, your operating system is your IDE. But uh, yeah, Idle. Yeah, Idle is a good one. Idle is one that a lot of people use. But yeah. So. So yeah. Um, good. So uh, let's get to the, uh, let's get to the actual lecture material. There are a couple, like we're now in a position where we're behind. Um, so I need to. I need to keep things rolling. So there are a couple of like analysis questions about the temperature example that we're going to skip. Um, if you want to go through those on your own steam, then I encourage you to do so. But we're gonna we're just gonna glaze over that um, and move right into the final section for topic one: programs. Yeah, if you don't have idle. If you download the Anaconda distribution as given on the syllabus, you will. So let's talk about what a program is. So, programs are algorithms that can be executed automatically by a computer. Historically speaking, um, or in general, there are two different types of computers. Uh, like, very generally speaking, there are two different types of computers. Fixed program computers and stored program computers. Um, now, there are lots and lots and lots of 
computers around that people don't really consider to be computers. And this kind of gets into embedded systems design territory, which is not what you guys care about at all, but, you know, it's interesting, at least should be. So, like, if you consider something like a, uh, a kitchen timer or a... Uh, or a washing machine or something like that. Like your washing machine has a has a little computer in it, right? But the program which that washing machine runs through cannot be changed. It's fixed. So it's a fixed program computer. It's manufactured in the factory like that and you have no ability to change the program on that computer during the uh, item's lifespan. So it's a fixed program computer. Computers, uh, sort of, computers that we would consider computers in the more proper sense are stored program computers. So a, a, a stored program computer actually, as it might imply, stores the program as a sequence of instructions somewhere inside of that computer's memory system. Um, the very early computers, before memory systems were really a thing, uh, were fixed program computers. But, um... One of the uh, one of the very first stored program computers was the Manchester Mark I, which was developed in 1949. Uh, very old, very large computer. This was from the era when computers would occupy an entire warehouse, right? Um, I never answer the question: Is this going to be on the test? If you don't think this is worth paying attention to, then don't pay attention to it. So, um, in a stored program computer, the program can be changed, obviously. Um, this achieved a very important result that allowed us to advance computers, which was we were storing instructions in the same way that we were storing data. Uh, this allows computers to be used to modify programs. Um, <clears throat> and this is sort of the fulfillment of the universality of these computing machines, which was anticipated by Alan Turing in 1936. If you don't know who Turing is, um, there is a, um, a reasonably good movie about him by, uh, uh, it's called The Imitation Game, I believe, uh, starring Benedict Cumberbun. Uh, which may interest you if you're interested in a bio flick on Alan Turing. Alan Turing occupies the same position in the field of computational science that someone like Newton or Einstein would in the position of uh, in the in the field of physics. Um, if not for Alan Turing, we wouldn't have computers in the same form that we do. What was the function of the Mark I? Well, um, the very early computers were actually used primarily for performing mathematical uh, uh, Benedict Cucumber. That's the one. Uh, these very early computers were used primarily for um, performing mathematical calculations reliably. Um, you know, they were used almost exclusively by research institutes and universities uh, places where you had to crunch a lot of numbers. So, like, you know, it's not an underestimate to say that, um, you know, your uh, Casio calculator that you, that are, that's standard, the standard McMaster calculator has, like, a great deal more horsepower than one of these guys would have originally, but this was still a huge advancement. Um, wasn't Alan Turing involved in cryptography? Yes, uh, well, the um, the Enigma project and the Enigma machine was a uh, crypto. That's a like that was a cryptology problem, right? Because they were trying to decrypt encrypted signals or encrypted, um, uh, yeah, radio signals that were being sent by the Nazis. Um, but yeah, it's actually very interesting because uh, you know it's because the British had this computational advantage that they were able to effectively um, carry out a campaign of misinformation against the Germans 
which allowed them to sort of misdirect the Germans and anticipate the wrong landing site on D-Day. So that's how they were able to uh, sneak the themselves and the Americans in uh, back in on uh, onto the European continent, which was like the major turning point in the war. Anyway, so let's talk computer architecture. So many of you will be aware of the sort of input-output model. Uh, this is like typically how computers are taught way on early on in elementary and high school. So you've got input and you've got output, right? Um, to your computer, you have input devices, you have output devices. You know, this thing is an input device, that camera is an input device, my keyboard is an input device, my mouse is an input device. Uh, output devices are this monitor, that monitor, my printer, uh, and of course, the speakers, all kinds of stuff like that. So we put information into the computer uh, using different devices than we get it out of, typically. So, um, and this is even true of like touch screens, right? If you were to take a touch screen and sort of split it into its component layers, um, the part that displays the image on a touch screen, like say on your phone, is distinct, completely distinct electronically from the part that registers your finger presses and finger taps. Um, they're, uh, you know, from a computational standpoint, they are separate input and output um, devices that are contained in the same package. But uh, anyway, so this is how a computer works, right? You have the CPU, right? The brain of the computer, you've probably heard it called. The central processing unit takes in inputs from input devices. It also takes in the state of memory from memory devices, which are contained in the computer system. It processes them and outputs, de outputs data to either the memory unit or to output devices, often both. Um, the, um, yeah, okay. So, if you're not familiar with this already, um, there are several different types of memory that are contained inside of a computer. Um, your sort of disk space, hard disk space, um, your solid state disk space, um, that is permanent memory. Right? So the reason we call it permanent memory is because the data that is contained inside your hard disk um, survives power cycling, right? The computer can be turned off for months, you reload it, and, or you turn it back on again, everything that's on your hard drive stays. Um, this is in contrast to RAM. Um, you know, that probably didn't surprise you. RAM or uh, stands for ra uh, ugh, random access memory. Uh, hard disk is ROM, or read-only memory, right? So the RAM, you know, RAM chips, like download more RAM here, that kind of thing. Um, that is what we call volatile memory. And volatile memory does not survive the computer being shut down. It requires an active power supply in order to maintain memory values. Um, so that's like me, like, so the RAM is like the operating memory of the computer system. Uh, when you load a program to be executed, it gets loaded into the RAM, generally speaking. Um, you have a third type, uh, and I'm, like, there are more types than this, but like, this is, this is like the rough categorization. Um, there's a third type of memory that's contained inside of the central processing unit itself, which is called register memory. The register memory is the memory that the computer can actually operate on. Um, the 2000s RAM disk would like to speak to you. Well, they, it can go... Um, <laughs> I don't care. So, 
So register memory is very, very fast. RAM is like medium speed, and um, ROM is slow, right? So the more permanent the memory is, the longer it takes to access it. General, like that's the engineering trade-off. That's why you have all of these different types of memory. Like way, 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 way back, um, like say in the 80s, mid 80s, late 80s, when you had uh, computer systems like the Apple II and the uh, the Commodore 64, those um, those computers did not have an internal ROM storage. They didn't have an ma internal magnetic drive. Well, some of them may have, but most of them didn't. Uh, so you would actually have floppy disks, right? And like, like you guys have heard of floppy disks, right? You can actually bend them. They're floppy. Um, they're not like the technology isn't a million way, million miles from a cassette tape. Um, so a floppy disk was your read-only memory. You would insert the disk. The disk would have a program on it, and the program would run uh, because the uh, the so the computer would look for it and start it up from there. Um, but back then, like, those computers would have also ha needed RAM, but the ROM was sort of external because it was very, very expensive back then. But anyway, so this is what's called von Neumann architecture. Um, anything that has a CPU uses von Neumann architecture. Um, unless it uses Harvard architecture, which is an ad adaptation of... Uh, von Neumann architecture. This is like a good, you know, working idea of how computers actually work. But that's like, this is the very, like, this is the essential pr uh, uh, piece of knowledge here, right? Is like, you have this chip, which must load data, either from input devices or the memory unit, process it, and then put it back into memory or to an output device. That is all that a computer does. That's it. That is the sum total of what a computer does. So, CPUs operate on bits, that is to say ones and zeros, grouped into words, typically 32 or 64 bit words. So, um, the word size of a operating system is what's meant by, you know, 32-bit, 64-bit. You probably f have heard of the phrase 64-bit operating system, right? <clears throat> it's important that you get the number of bits of the operating system correct because it has to line up with the hardware. So generally speaking, like, the majority of computers, like actual, like, laptops and things, uh, most things running, like, Intel chips or AMD chips will be 64-bit word size. Um, many ARM architecture bo uh, boards, which are things like cell phones, are still running 32-bit operating systems, actually. But, uh, you know, 32 bits, as it turns out, is sufficient for most things. Um, but yeah, it's... Uh, If you go back historically, um, basically the far further back you go, the fewer bits you, the word size of the CPU is. Uh, if you take, for example, the Nintendo Entertainment System, uh, the NES had a 8-bit word size, right? That's why it's only capable of producing 256 colors, because, um, you know, 2 to the power of 8 is 256, which is the number, like, that's the most number of things you can represent with one 8-bit number. So that's why uh, the NES only had um, only had 256 colors available. Um, stepping up to the Super Nintendo, the Super Nintendo was a 16-bit operating system, which also supported floating-point operations. Um... <clears throat> um And once you get to the N64, the uh, the N64, of course, um, is like a uh, 64-bit operating system, right? So it go sort of steps up over time. I have a question. What is the smallest bit size? Is it less than 2? Well, 
I would modify your question to say what is the smallest useful bit size. Um, and I would say it's 8. Like, um, you'll notice that all of these things are powers of 2, right? 32 is a power of 2, 64 is a power of 2, um, 16 is, 8 is, 4, 2, and 1. So, hypothetically speaking, there may have been, you know, 4-bit CPUs in the past, but, uh, you know, they weren't useful enough to be able to, to really see mass a adoption. Like, you're starting to get back into the sort of recedes of misty time, uh, back to the point where Pong consoles were a thing, right? Um, generally speaking, designing your own electronic circuitry would have, like, what was more efficient and like you're talking like back in the early 70s right um back then designing your own piece of electronic circuitry would have been more cost effective and useful than um trying to implement things on a cpu which only supports you know four bit operations so um so it was really only when cpus hit eight bits that they really started becoming useful but yeah, so, um, so some of the main operations you can that the CPU performs on memory is to load pieces of data from memory into the register, do arithmetic operations on data in the registers, store data from registers back into memory, and jump to another instruction based of, on the value of data in a register. Some early programming languages. Um, well, there was a period of time when all programming languages were written on what are called punch cards. So a punch card um, looked like this, right? Um, you literally, this is how you programmed, folks, back in, back in the 60s. You had these cards. You had a stack of like 200 of them. You had a little hole puncher, and you would punch holes in the card that would designate an instruction or operation this is the this is a fortran car uh, punch card which expresses um an if statement so the reason that they did this this was like um a form of physical memory that didn't need to be electronic they could you know they could build a little uh, reading device that could detect whether or not the um there was a hole in the card or not which uh you know um Probably was done optically. Programming on a Scantron, lol. Yeah, really. So that's, like, please, please, please appreciate the era into which you've been born. That you don't have to learn programming on punch cards. Um, because truly, truly, in the past, things were not fun. But, uh, so, Fortran was one of the earliest programming languages. Like, proper programming languages. Um... It stands for formula translation. So you can tell that's what computers were being used for back in the 50s. It was like, you have a formula, you translate the formula using Fortran, and then you execute it automatically on a computer. Um, starting with Algol and Pascal, um, programming languages began to use something closer to an algorithmic notation that we would recognize today. Um, particularly Fortran 77, which is still in use today, if you can believe it, um, uses the types of uh, language constructs that we're going to be seeing in Python. Um, basically, it required the development of new technologies in order to enable um, programming in sort of the proper sense that we see now. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm not that old. No. Oop. Um, no, my first languages were not on punch cards. Uh, but programming, like when I was learning programming, was a lot less convenient than it is for you wh young whippersnappers, so please appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> so...
basically, in order to enable, like, languages that you type, you would, first you need, you needed to hook up an electric typewriter into a computer system, which I don't think was real, like, that was done reasonably early, but, um, like, you're talking probably the 60s that they made that innovation. And then you needed, uh, cathode ray tubes to be, like, reliable and controllable enough to be able to display text, right? Um, once we got that far, um, we were off to the races. But, you know, for decades, computers were without these things we would consider to be absolutely crucial. Um, also, graphical programming languages. Some of you may have used graphical programming languages in the past. There's one, uh, I forget what it's called, but it's like, you have like puzzle pieces that represent different code and you sort of click them together and stuff like that. I forget what it's called, but um, uh, generally speaking, uh, real programmers don't use graphical programming languages because they're not fast enough. You can type faster than you can mouse, so um, typing is preferred. Scratch. Yeah, Scratch. That, that is. There it is. So. So. Compilers translate high-level programs into machine language. So it's very important. Like, there's a very, very important distinction to be drawn here, right? When you code in Python, the Python code that you're writing is not being directly executed by the CPU. It is a language that has been put together for your convenience. The CPU has its own language, which is often called machine language and is sometimes called assembly language, although there is a slight difference between machine and assembly language that we won't get into. So. Python is what we call a high-level language. Every single statement that you execute in Python, particularly if you're using functions, translates to sometimes a very large number of individual machine instructions. So for, if we take the example, let's say we are assigning u the result of u minus v, right? So this is how you would perform that in kind of a pseudocode. If we have registers 1 and 2, we load the value of u into register 1, we load the value of v into register 2, we perform a subtraction operation over, so it's r1 minus r2, store the result in r1, and then we store the result that's in r1 back into u. So this one little statement in something like Python is translated to at least four operations uh, when you get to the machine code language uh, level. Um, this is something that you'll have to worry about a bit m like more when you start dealing with lower level languages like C, but it's important to understand. Um, so there are a large number of different programming languages, so I'm just going to give you some like general um, uh, characteristics, like characteristic categories even. So you have high-level languages and low-level languages. So this is kind of a, um, this is a, this is a, uh, 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 idiom of speech which is particular to programmers, right? Um, some of you may think that this is like, should be flipped, but, uh, at any rate. So what a high-level language, what it means for a le uh, language to be high-level is that the program, the, the language itself provides a large number of abstractions um, so that you can formulate mathematical modeling, uh, math, so you can formulate things more easily. Um, does that make Python a, an easier language? Uh, yes, to some degree. I would say that uh, Python is deceptive. It, uh, People think it's easy, but it is just as hard as any other language when you get right down to it. Um, so, in general, 
What makes something a high-level language is that any particular statement in that language gets translated to a large number of machine language constructs. Um, low-level languages, on the other hand, each statement in a low-level language gets, con gets converted to comparatively few um, statements in the actual machine language. What is a register? A register is internal memory stored inside of the CPU. So, at the top end, uh, with respect to high-level languages, we've got languages like Python, R, and Haskell. At the low end, uh, low level of abstraction languages, you've got languages like C and Assembly. Visual Basic and Java are somewhere in the middle. Question. Does that make low-level languages faster? Yes. <laughs> like, actually. Um, so, and when we say C, we mean C slash C++, really. Um, although C++ would probably be, like, somewhere between Java and C. But, uh, yeah, so... Yeah. So, essentially... The amount of time it takes a program to execute is the number of uh, instructions that it has to execute. So fewer instructions mean faster program. But it's also more difficult to program at a low level. It's a higher level skill, so to speak. It's um, It requires more brain to program in C or assembly. And you can't get as much done... Uh, basically, a C program that you write will be longer but it translates to less than the CPU. Uh, Python, you'll write a smaller amount of code, but it'll be blown up even larger, right? Yeah, yeah, it won't matter for this course. Like, efficiency won't really matter for this course, but yeah. Um, there was, uh, there's this one example I always like to bring up of um, a student of mine, or someone who knew a student of mine, was implementing a, um, a vision processing algorithm, like a vision process, or, you know, image processing stuff. Uh, you know, it uses, uh, like, bitmaps and stuff and just does processing. Anyway, like, there was a library for it that uh, in Python, and they said, you know what, this isn't fast enough, I'm going to re-implement it in C++. So they did, and it was five times faster and it was nothing more than a simple line-for-line -line translation from Python into C++. They didn't do any additional optimization. And that's not even to mention the fact that in uh, languages like C and Assembly, there are optimizations that are possible that are unimaginable in Python. Like, they, they, you couldn't, you can't optimize Python to the same degree that you can optimize C, because you don't have direct... Uh, control over the uh, the memory. And of course, some Python enthusiast is going to come in on the chat and say, well, actually, if you do it this way. But uh, anyway. So yeah. We also have a difference between application-specific languages and general-purpose languages. So um, this one's pretty easy to figure out. S some languages are meant for very specific tasks. Other languages are meant for any type of programming task that you want to throw at them. Um, for example, SQL <clears throat> is used specifically for databases, HTML is used specifically for web pages, and R is used specifically for statistics. While it is possible to do general purpose programming in something like SQL, it's generally not recommended. Uh, a general-purpose programming language is more efficient for that purpose. Um, whereas, there are definite, like, there are definitely, um, uh, and it, it goes the other way, too. Like, you can use Python for most things, including doing statistical work, uh, but at a certain point, it's more efficient to use, you know, R. Um... Are more soft more software programs written in low-level languages then? It depends on the application. So, with both of these things, actually, um, you should not think 
of a programming language. Like, the correct way to think of a programming language is as a tool that you apply to a problem, right? Now, we're just doing Python in this in this course, so you're going to be using the same tool for everything. But um, the seasoned and experienced veteran programmer does not use Python for everything. They look at a problem and they say, huh, this language is the most efficient solution for, uh, that's the most efficient language for that problem. I'm going to do my solution in that language. Um, so it's not like, that's why there's no best programming language, right? Different languages have different things they're good at, uh, particularly the popular ones. So, um, you know, you have to always consider what, what, the, what you want the program to do, right? Um, when considering which programming language to use. So what about CSS? Uh, what is that? CSS would be a application specific for sure. Are there languages that can be used for all tasks with high efficiency? Yes. Um, C can be used for any task with high efficiency. However, it is a bugger to program in if you're doing anything larger than, you know, say a thousand lines. It's, um, it kind of lacks the, like, so there's another trade-off at work here, right? Um, basically, high level versus low level doesn't just imply efficiency. The higher the level, the higher level the language is, the more abstract the language is, the better you can cope with large programs, right? So consider, for instance, object-oriented programming, right? Um, you probably have heard of object-oriented programming before. Um, so object-oriented starts around here on this, right? Haskell isn't, uh, neither Haskell nor R, I'd say, are object-oriented. I might be wrong about R, but, um, you know, Java, Visual Basic, Python, definitely object-oriented. C is not an object-oriented language, so it lacks the abstraction mechanisms that for example, C++ has, right? So, to the degree that being able to program with objects is useful and saves you time, that's, that's the price you're paying for programming in C. Now, programming in C, you will, you will be able to beat the performance of pretty much any other language, but the question is, how much time are you going to spend writing the program, right? Um, if you think of a software, a piece of software as a product, right, um, in order to, like, in order to d determine how much money, like, basically you've got two different cost profiles that go on with any product, and all of you who think that this is Commerce 1MD3, which I get in the emails frighteningly, frighteningly, uh, frequently. This is not Commerce 1MD3. This is Computer Science 1MD3. I know they both start with C, but come on. So, up front, you've got your development cost, right? We call that non, we sometimes call that non-recurring engineering cost, right? Um, then, you've got your, um, support cost, right? So, programming in a language that is difficult to use increases your, um, it increases your, uh, non-recurring non engineering cost because the program is more difficult to write in the first place, but it also has the effect of raising your cost over time, um, your support cost, because, you know, Fixing bugs in a C program is also difficult because it lacks the kinds of abstractions that you, you know, that you require, uh, that you would need to make th your life easier in another language. So, like, basically C and these low-level languages are reserved for applications where you really do need the speed. So, for example, the Linux kernel, 
written primarily in C and some of it in assembly language. Assembly language is so difficult to use, it's really used only very, very rarely. And only for like very, like applications with which, you know, in which the speed is not optional. Uh, most people use high level languages for most things. So, um, we've also got the differences between difference between compiled and interpreted, and this is not a continuum. This is actually like you are either compiled or interpreted. So, um, essentially, when you have a compiled language, basically up to this point, I've been describing compiled languages. Um, you write a program. You run, a, you run a program that takes your programming code as input and it outputs an executable file. You then run that executable file to run the program. That's how, comp that's how compilation works. Interpreted languages are a bit different. With an interpreted language, you feed the code into an interpreter and the interpreter just directly executes it. Um, the interpreter itself produces the results. There's no executable file which is produced. Now, often with interpreted languages, you can choose to um, to compile to an executable if you so choose. But um, most of the time, uh, the language is happy to just hang out inside of the interpreter. Python is in interpreted languages. So um, when you run a Python program, it is running inside of program in inside of Python itself, which is why it, one of the reasons Python is a relatively slow language. We also have um, so there are also paradigms, right? And we've talked about it a little bit, but um, there are three primary. Uh, um, groups that programming languages can be put in. You've got imperative or procedural languages. Uh, Object-oriented languages fall into this category. Um, programs are uh, In this category, programs are sequences of operations. Uh, examples of imperative or procedural or object-oriented languages include C, C++, C Sharp, Java, Visual Basic, um, F Sharp, Ruby, uh, Perl, PH, PHP. I don't know about PHP, um, but anyway, you get that. Uh, you get the idea. Lots and lots of lang most programming languages are object oriented. You also have declarative or functional languages. These programming languages focus on the on functions and the relationships between functions. Essentially, you declare that something is the case, and the computer has to figure out for itself how to calculate it. They tend to be high level languages. So in this category, you get things like Lisp, you get um, ML, OCaml, things in the ML family, Haskell, um, oh, what's that other one? Scala, Scala as well. They're more rare, and programming in a functional language is a hot, like, in my personal opinion, Functional languages have a higher skill cap than uh, than procedural languages, and that's saying something because, um, generally speaking, the skill cap on programming is ludicrously high. Um, and you know, if you're not a gamer, then a skill cap is basically you know how how good can you get at this at this you know. Uh, before you sort of hit the point of diminishing returns. You also have logical languages. Um, these are used the least frequently. Um, they can be used for reasoning about logical statements, but uh, you probably won't see these again until, you know, second year. I don't know. But uh, anyway, so that's class. Are there any questions?
So, is the Python interpreter made in Python? Uh, partially, but it's also made in C. The C compiler is made from C. The Haskell compiler is, compiler is made from ca Haskell. But yeah, no, uh, Python is not a self-interpreting language. Like, yeah. Like, for, yeah, for Haskell, you have GHC. GHC is a compiler. Yeah. So I have a question. Um, so, yes, yeah, you don't have to spam the question. I see it. Um, oh, yeah, Haskell has the GHCI interpreter, but, you know, it's, you know, it has both. But if it's, if it has a compiler, it's compiled, basically. Um, why doesn't the code work without writing abs before the instructions? Um, um, that's that question is not necessarily appropriate for a lecture, Lorian. Um, if you'd like to ask me that question during my office hours, which are next, then I would be happy to take a look at your code. But I, like. Basically, it's impossible for me to tell you why your code isn't working without actually seeing your code, and please don't copy and paste it into the chat. Um, you know, it's... Uh, I, I would be happy to look at that problem with you after class. And I certainly am not happy to look at that question for you in the middle of class. Please have some respect for the fact I'm trying to do a lecture here. Um... So, why do so many languages exist? Well, it's kind of like, um, you know, I would say that, you know, there are so many programming languages for similar reasons that there are so many spoken languages. A language develops because you have sort of a small um, group of people who decide, decide to develop one. It is a reflection of the culture that is shared between all of the people who work on the development of the language. Um, like, there are literally thousands of programming languages. It's just there are only a few popular ones, right? Um, so, like, you have all of these different, like, different languages which are all competing for um, market share, essentially. And, you know, like, languages go derelict and become dead all the time all the time um, because they're not useful anymore. And in some cases, it's because they're not, like, like they're superseded by um, by other languages. Like, they don't do anything unique unto themselves. Um, languages, like, sometimes a language is popular because it has been popular for a long period of time. Like, um, it has to do with the amount of existing code base, right? So, like... If you work at a company and like 90% of the code that has been written at that company that you have to maintain has been written in Java, uh, you better know Java, right? Um, but yeah, it's like uh, new languages are coming along all the time, which um, like if you want to get into like the mathematical end of things... Um, Research is constantly ongoing to try to improve uh, the mathematics that go into programming languages. So generally speaking, when a new language comes along, um, the good ones anyway, are trying to use research, recent research into the mathematics of programming languages to improve the programming languages. Um, so, you know, new ones are coming along all the time. Uh, the marketplace determines which ones are popular. And, uh, yeah, that's, you know, it's because, uh, you know, this was a better approach than having a universal, uh, one universal programming language. It's like, again, asking why there's, like, more than one programming language is like asking why isn't there just one tool in the hardware store, you know? It's like, well, you need different tools for different tasks. It's actually a really good thing that there are these this many languages. Um, are games made in C? Um, 
Um, so, modern video games are normally built in a uh, inside of a like a pre-built engine, such as Unity or Unreal. Um, Unity uses C Sharp as its scripting backend. Unreal Engine uses C++. Um, so that's getting closer to C. Uh, as far as I'm aware, no gaming, no modern game engine uses C. Um, I think that either like Game Maker or Godot use Python, but I might. I, I'm probably wrong about that. But uh, yeah, so you may you may notice that all of the highly optimized games, uh, like generally speaking, if a game is highly optimized, it's probably running Unreal, um, and you know that's because C++ has a greater capacity for optimization. But um, yeah, it's it's no trouble, Lorian. It's just you know, I know it. I know it's kind of an informal atmosphere. But uh, in order to uh, in order to make you know keep progress with the course, I, I have to I have to focus on the the lecture material, right? Um, what's my favorite game? Oh boy. Um, my favorite video game of all time. Chess. Ha! Fooled you. That's not a video game. Favorite of all time. Pass. Mario 3. Super Mario Brothers 3. There you go. Um, Alright. Anyway. <laughs> Take her easy, everyone. I'll see you on Friday.